Thank you all for joining us. I'm Lucy Beadnell, and I work here at the Ark of Northern Virginia. It is very much our pleasure to be having this presentation today on the disability determination process, kind of the life of the case as it works through Social Security. So earlier this year, Medicaid changed some rules on Social Security and determination, and I was having a fit, and I cannot tell you how many people I called and emailed trying to get a clear answer on what was going on. And eventually, I, in like one day, three people said, you've got to copy this up. <laughs> so <laughs> I ended up with her, and not only was she wonderful and helpful and mm -hmm. fast and thorough, she then said, would you like me to give a presentation? And would you like me to bring someone else who could talk about more things? And Christmas had come early to the Ark of Northern Virginia, so we are absolutely elated to have them and their expertise here on these questions that we get every single day here. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you, and then let me know if you need any help with the slides here. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vita Cyrus. I am the Professional Relations Officer at the Disability Determination Services here in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, my office makes the medical decisions on disability claims and some Medicaid disability claims as well. As Lucy mentioned earlier, the Medicaid rules changed January 1, 20, uh, 2019, earlier this year. So as a result, uh, more folks are eligible for Medicaid without having to go through the disability process. We're working on um, fewer and fewer, fewer claims, which is good. That means more folks are able to get benefits without having to go through, through the disability process. Um, but today I'm going to go over the life of a case um, once it gets to our office. The first step is if someone is, feels like they're disabled and can no longer work, they would then go to the, their local Social Security office to start the application process or they can start that process online. Once Social Security does what they need to do, they send the case to the DDS and we then make our medical decision. Um, Social, Security, Social Security Disability is an, uh, a program, it's a work-based program, so essentially when you're applying for benefits, you're saying because of my disability, I can no longer work and make substantial gainful activity, which is, I'll go over that um, in a few minutes. So that's pretty much what I'm going to be going over today, just the life of the case once they leave Social Security and come to us, and then so when Millie goes, when it's her turn, she's going to talk about more of the initial steps with what they do on their end and kind of what's done after we send the case back to Social Security after DDS makes their determination. Okay, so first I want to go over the definition of disability. It's broken up into three different parts. The first part is the person has to um, have the inability to engage in any substantial gainful activity. Each year that amount is determined by Social Security and usually it increases a little bit each year. So for this year it's $1,220 per month. So if you're able, if you're not able to work um, and make, if, you, if you're working and making more than that amount per month, you're not eligible to apply for disability benefits. If you're working part-time or even full-time and making under that amount, you do meet that first step of the definition. So we can then go on to the other two steps to see if you even, um, if you meet the, the definition of disability according to Social Security. You have to have a uh, medical or uh, medically determinable impairment, whether it's a physical impairment or mental impairment. Um, so that would be determined by medical records that we would get, office notes from your doctor, hospital, lab work, things like that. So take how you take that. Also, your disability, your, your medically determinable impairment will need to be um, last a continuous period of 12 months or more or result in your death. So um, this is an example I always give when you're pregnant. You're pregnant for about 9 or 10 months. That's not going to meet that 12-month um, period. Although some women who are pregnant, they cannot work, um, and they may have some other issues as a result, maybe like some, some back issues, some joint issues, but that impairment is not going to last more than 12 months because after the baby comes, usually those issues kind of resolve themselves. Um, so, it's, so for our purposes, it's really important that these three parts of the definition are met. And that's what kind of separates Social Security definition versus <coughs> other um, disability definitions like workers' comp or like any kind of private disability insurance where these three have to be met. And it's a permanent disability, it's not any kind of temporary or short-term or part-time disability, it's got to be permanent disability. I do have uh, 
Um, most of the slides I try to include a website that you can always go back and refer to because that's pretty much where I got all this information from. So if you have more questions or just kind of want more information about that, you can always go to these websites to, to get some more information. So I'm going to talk about the two disability programs that we make medical decisions for. The first one is SSDI. So these are this program is for people who work in pays into the system. When you work, you get these taxes taken out of your chest. That goes and in, pays into this um, to this program. So if I ever, ever later on down the road if you're disabled or you feel like you can no longer work due to your disability, you're eligible to apply for the benefits. This is kind of comparable to like a paying auto insurance. You pay your premiums, you pay just in case something happens, you're covered. So this is kind of the same thing you pay. You have the money taken out of, you know, the taxes taken out of your check every couple, you know, every time you get paid. And, you know, if you get to the point where you feel like you can no longer work, you pay into the system and you are covered for this type of program. The other program is SSI, Supplemental Security Income. These are benefits payable to adults or children who are blind or disabled. Um, and they're looking for this program, looking at your income and resources. Um, so a person can be eligible for both types of programs, or one type of program, or, or no type, or neither of the programs. When at DDS we're making our decisions, um, we don't. It doesn't matter what kind of program that you're applying for. We're going to make our decision the same way, no matter what kind of program you've applied for. When it's Millie's turn, she's going to go more into depth about what they're looking at to determine if someone is eligible for SSI benefits or not. This form, um, the 1696, it allows DDS, my office, and Social Security to speak to a third party about the claimant's application. So a third party can be like a law, a, law, a law group, an advocacy group, maybe a neighbor telling them not with their claim, or someone like that. This allows us to talk to that other person about their claim. Um, so the form just has to be completed by the person applying for benefits and, as well as the person who will be representing the claimant. Here on this, I have included the website where you can obtain this form as well. Like I mentioned before, we do make decisions for Medicaid disability claims. The process is, is exactly the same except that the decision, the final determination is sent to the local um, DSS office, the Department of Social Services office, where the person resides. I'm going to go over the process. Like I mentioned before, the process starts at the local Social Security office, whether that's you go in person or you file the application online. They're going to look to determine what type of program you're eligible to apply for. They're going to do a lot of, um, you know, they need to check your identity. They're going to need your identification. They're going to do a lot of extensive kind of background work to make sure you're actually who you say you are. Once all of that is, um, has been done, they send the case over to the DDS. We have four DDSs in Virginia, one in Fairfax, um, Richmond, Roanoke, and Norfolk. Typically, the case is sent to the, the DDS that's closest to where you live, but oftentimes we do share cases amongst the four offices. So depending if one office has kind of a higher backlog, some of those cases might be transferred to one of the other DDSs. So we all process cases the same. It doesn't matter which location, the, what DDS is working on your claim. Once we get the claim, the first thing we do is we request medical records. We do pay for medical records. We pay $15 to the hospital or to the doctor's office to get the medical records. And I would say most um, hospitals and doctor's offices are familiar with the disability process, but when they get our medical requests, they are familiar with them, and they're able to kind of get us the records. Um, some facilities we have an agreement with where we're able to get the records pretty much instantly, like the bigger hospitals like Inova, um, UVA, we were able to get those records very quickly within seconds. So that, those are really helpful and that really helps make our determination that much quicker. Um, so we'll send the records, whether it's electronically we'll send them or we'll mail a request or we'll fax the request. Um, so we give the, the doctors or hospitals about, probably about um, maybe three weeks to get back to us, I think two to three weeks to get back to us. And if we haven't received the records, we're calling and say, hey, you know, we sent you this request, what's the status, so we're really actively trying to get those medical records to make our decision. Also, we mail the claimant forms that we need them to complete. One of the bid forms we send out is what we call the ADL form, which is the Activities of Daily Living form. 
It's a rather lengthy form, which we're asking a lot of questions to kind of get an idea of how the person is functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're going to ask questions such as, um, do you have, are you able to cook, clean, do you have problems walking, do you have problems getting along with other people, just kind of to get an idea of kind of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. <coughs> we're also going to send out the work history form. That's probably one of the most important forms we're going to send out because, like I mentioned, Earlier, this is a work-based program, so we're needing to know all the jobs that the person has had over the last 15 years because that's kind of an important piece when we're making our determination. And then depending on what the person is alleging, we might send out a pain questionnaire or seizure, seizure questionnaire to kind of get some more additional information. What we need to make um, our, our medical decision, what we require in the medical records is a medical history, which Typically, all doctors are doing that anyway. When you see a doctor, they're going to ask you, you know, what, how, what is your issue? How long has this been going on for? We just kind of need to kind of get a background information. We're going to need clinical findings, whether that's a physical exam or a mental status examination. If appropriate, we're going to be asking for any lab reports, um, any x-rays, blood work, blood work, anything like that. We're going to need a diagnosis as well and we're going to need the prescribed treatment with response and prognosis. And again, this is pretty much what's included in all medical records. When you go to a doctor's office, this is what they're going to be writing down anyway. So that's usually not an issue um, in the medical records we get. This is pretty much all included. But if there's a time when we cannot get the medical records, let's say um, the doctor has retired or moved or doesn't cooperate with DDS, unfortunately, or doesn't feel like we, you know, they don't want to accept the $15, they want more money, whatever the case is, if we cannot obtain those medical records, what we'll do is we'll schedule the claimant to see one of our doctors in the community who will perform that examination for them. We call that a CE, a consultative examination. Um, so this is good, again, like I mentioned, if we can't get the medical records or let's say the person didn't know they needed to go to a doctor. Maybe their impairment, that's probably, maybe that's one of the symptoms of their impairment is that they don't know they have an issue, so they never went to the doctor, or they didn't have money, or they didn't have insurance. Whatever the case is, doesn't matter. We'll get the evidence we need. We'll send them, like I said, to, one, to see one of our doctors in the community. Um, these doctors perform exams for GDS. GDS pays the doctor. We um, schedule the appointment. We pay the clinic back for travel expenses if that's something that they want to get reimbursed for. We'll take care of that. These examinations, um, they're not going to be like when you go get your physical with your doctors. They're not going to be that intense, not that in-depth, but it's going to include the information that we need to make our medical decisions. And I go out, one of my duties is to go out into the field to try to recruit doctors to perform the exams for DDS, and I do train them as to what we need to have in their reports. And that, it's they're really express to them that it's not going to be your typical patient that you see who's got you know, health insurance, the police cost, blue shield. This is something much different. You know, we really need to hit these key points. We need that information in order to make the decision for this person. <laughs> the struggle that we have, unfortunately, is we don't pay a lot of money for these exams. So, you know, when we, luckily there are people out there who understand and want to help out and kind of give back and they're willing to do these exams for us at a lower rate because they would, doctors would definitely get a lot more money if they just took someone who was insured, they would get more money that way. But, you know, um, luckily, you know, like I said, we do have providers in the community who, who will do these exams for us. These are medical doctors, these are psychologists, these are speech language pathologists, these are optometrists, um, some audiologists we have. That's a tough one to get because, you know, that's a specialty and it's, it's, it's difficult to get those types of doctors, but, you know, we're really trying um, to, you know, to get those doctors because we do need to sometimes get those appointments for, for claiming. So I wanted to go over what we call acceptable medical sources. Like I mentioned a couple slides ago, we need to have a diagnosis um, by a doc, by an acceptable medical source. Um, until March 2017, that was a medical doctor, a psychologist, um, an optometrist, a physiatrist, SLP, a speech language pathologist, or a school psychologist, depending on what the impairment is. But after March 2017, 
They have broadened that to include physician assistants, audiologists, and advanced nurse practitioners, which is really, really good because a lot of our claimants, um, they don't have health insurance, they don't have any money, they were going to clinics to get their treatment, which is okay, but a lot of times medical doctors or psychologists or psychiatrists were not always on staff when they went for their appointment. So they, they would get the, the exams, get the treatment and everything, but we could not use those reports because they were not signed by an acceptable medical source. But since they opened up you know, the criteria of two years ago, it's been really helpful, so we're having to get less CE because we're able to use the notes from the clinic that you know, our clinics are going to. It's been really helpful. It's been really good because I think, in my experience, sometimes the notes from the clinics are a lot more in-depth, a lot more in detail than, you know, going to a medical doctor for a So we really do. We're really, when that came out, we were really excited and really happy about that. We do have a type of claim that we process, which we call compassionate allowances. Um, these are conditions that should, by Social Security standards, um, make the person eligible for benefits. There's a list of a little over 200. I have the website here if you wanted to, to peruse those. Usually these, on the impairments on this list are um, like childhood cancer, the kind of rare diseases that you don't see that often that will be on the list. So just because you have that um, diagnosis doesn't always mean an allowance, but more than likely it will mean an allowance. And those cases are kind of fast-tracked and they're expedited, they go to the top of the list. So if you apply and Social Security sends the case to DDS, instead of it going in the backlog and sitting for a couple weeks, a month or so, it'll go right to the top of the list. So those claims we do expedite. Another type of case we work on is called a SOAR claim, which stands for SSI, SSBI, Outreach, Access, and Recovery. And this is for individuals who are homeless or at risk of being homeless. Um, so at risk of being homeless means folks who might be staying with someone and someone, this person keeps threatening to kick them out at the end of the month. Or just kind of an unstable living situation where it's not permanent. Um, so this, type of, this, is, this program is sponsored by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and has been going on for about 15 years now. All 50 states participate in this and there's no direct funding. So another one of my job duties is um, working with the SOAR coordinator for Virginia. We have folks in throughout Virginia who um, work with these individuals and these cases, they work with them very closely to help them um, do the application. Because, you know, a lot of times, you know, if you're homeless, if you don't have a stable um, living environment, you may have trouble processing the application or you don't understand the process. So these four workers work with these individuals to help them throughout this process. Um, so I meet with the store coordinator and the store workers in Northern Virginia, and we have um, quarterly meetings to kind of touch base and just kind of make sure things are working like they should. Um, if these store workers have any questions or they're concerned about the case, they'll reach out to me, they'll reach out to Millie, and we work with them to kind of make sure that these cases do not fall into the cracks. So now I'm going to go over the steps that we take at DBS when we're making our determination. We go through each, we go through these steps each time we're making a decision on a case. So again, we're going to be looking at the person working and making SG. That's the first thing. Um, when they apply to Social Security, they're checking that. Um, but throughout the life of the case, once it's at DBS, sometimes people may go back to work or they were working kind of under the table kind of thing. And if we see any mention of work, in the medical records, we have to call, we have to clarify. So that's a big um, issue. Um, we cannot, if somebody is working and making over that amount, they're not eligible for benefits, unless there's some other conditions that, that, may, um, that may apply. But typically, we cannot um, you know, allow that person. So again, if there's any mention of work, and usually we find out about work is if when we're looking at medical records and it says John Doe came in because he fell off the ladder while he was at work. It's like, okay, so we have to call that person and say, hey, you know, I saw this in the medical records, you know, kind of are you at work or, you know, what, what happened? So we need to clarify that. Again, we do that with every case that we get. We need to check and see if the person is working and making over SGA. So we're then going to look and see is the person's impairment severe. So severe would need to cause um, some kind of interference in your day-to-day -day functioning. So if someone is just alleging high cholesterol and that's their only allegation, that's probably not going to be severe. Um, but if they've got, you know, like 
arthritis and diabetes and high blood pressure, all those are severe, so we would then go on to step three. Does their impairment meet or equal the medical listing? So Social Security has what we call a blue book, um, and it has listing, it has impairments that typically if you meet that criteria, you're more than likely to be approved for benefits. And it lists it out by body system. It's divided um, by adults and children, because adults and children are looked at differently when we're looking at the disability um, process. So some, some impairments that are up there, like if you're on chronic renal dialysis or something, you know, that would be, you're meeting the listing pretty much meaning you're going to be approved for benefits. If you have Down syndrome, um, if you have an intellectual disability, you know, those kinds of things, we're gonna, those are going to be just very quick and easy. You know, the person is going to uh, meet the benefit, meet and, and be eligible for benefits. And on the blue, I have the website here. You know, you can always check and, and, and see, get some more information about that. Um, but if they don't meet or equal the listings, meaning they do have some issues, maybe, you know, they've got, they're on dialysis, but it's not. Chronic, it's not going to be like a permanent kind of thing, or they have something else that's not as bad as it doesn't meet the severity of the blue book. We're going to then go on to step four. Um, we're going to look and see can they go back and do work that they've done before? And again, that's where that work history form comes into play. So we're going to look and see at the jobs you've done in the past and look at how you're functioning right now to see despite your issues that you have now, can you go back and do other types? Can you go back and do work you've done in the past? If the person cannot, let's say now we're, you know, they're really restricted, they have trouble walking, they've got like hip issues, and maybe they're short of breath, you know, and all their past work has been construction and a lot of heavy lifting. There's no way they can go back to do that kind of work. So in that case, if you go on to step five, can they do other types of work? So in that case, when you're looking at um, any skills that they've learned from past work that they've done in, in you know, work that they've done in the past. We're going to be looking at um, we're going to be looking at their age and their education as well to determine if they can transfer skills to other types of jobs. So typically, the older you are, the harder it's going to be to transfer skills um, to another type of uh, you know to a different kind of job. So we then you know at that step, we're going to be looking at all that information and looking at their age and looking at all the restrictions to determine you know whether they would be approved or not. When we're making our decision, we're working very closely with in-house medical doctors or psychologists, depending on what the issue is. Um, the doctors are looking at the medical side. They know the medical side. They know if someone has a broken hip, for example, it's going to take them eight months to recover. I don't know if that's true or not. But they know that, and they know that the person should be fully recovered within 10 months. Um, but the DDS analyst, we know the legal side because this is a legal program. The training is very intense and in-depth. We're looking at all the rules and regulations, so we know what the rules and regulations say about different kinds of things. So we work together when we're making our medical determination. We do have a quality review department that randomly pulls cases to review them to make sure the correct decision is made. Um, this is internal, and we do have a federal quality review department as well. So that, again, they're going to be checking everything, making sure policy, policies and procedures are followed correctly. If anything is wrong, then I send the case back to the analyst for correction before it can be released to SSA. So it's really important that we're making the correct decision the first time um, to avoid the case being sent back and also to avoid delays and that person getting their decision whether it's an approval or not, so people can kind of take the next step. If for any reason um, the claimant does not agree with their decision, they do have the option to appeal, and the appeals have to be submitted within 60 days, 60 days of their decision. So I'm just going to go over the steps in an appeal. So you have the initial determination. That's when you first file for your disability. Um, if you're denied, you can then file what we call a reconsideration claim, which will be number two. At the reconsideration level, a new doctor will review the claim and a new analyst will review the claim. And they're going to look and make sure everything was done the correctly the first time. And if in the meantime the person has gone to the doctor or their condition has worsened, um, you know, we're going to get those medical records and we're going to, you know, take that into consideration. And we might reverse the decision if the person has gotten worse off or there's been some kind of change in their condition that kind of meets the definition of disability. The person is denied again at that recon level, they do have the option to go in front of the judge, the administrative law judge. 
to get to in front of the administrative law judge, it could take a year or more. So that's something, you know, kind of to keep in mind. You're going to be waiting at least a year to kind of get in front of the judge, and the judge is going to review all the medical records. They're going to request new medical records if you go back to the doctor. If you haven't gone to the doctor, they're going to request a CE. You're kind of going through everything all over again. If you get denied at the AOJ level, you have the option to go in front of the appeals council where they're, going, again, going to be doing the same thing, looking over everything, making sure the correct decision was made and getting updated medical records if necessary. And then if you get denied at the appeals council level, you have the option to go to the federal court. One thing that um, I do mention, I do want to mention, you have to take into consideration if you want to continue on with the appeals process, which could really take years to get down to number five, or if you want to start over from the beginning. Um, if you start over from the beginning, you could lose out on potential benefits, because if you go all the way down and you get approved, you're eligible for back pay. But if you start over from one, there's, you're not going to be, and you get approved, you wouldn't be eligible for any back pay. So that's kind of a personal decision that you, you know, want to keep in mind if you're deciding if you want to appeal or start over again. Here I just have a list of some um, references. The first one is the Blue Book listing. Um, this is a website that links directly to it. Or you can always Google Blue Book listings, and you'll be able to get that information there. I have here just a disability determination process. Just again, telling, just going over kind of the process at the DDS and kind of what the analysts are doing uh, once they get a case until the case is, is done. Ways to apply for disability benefits. There's some forms listed here and some um, additional information as well. The last um, link is just talks about DARS and DDS. Our parent agency, DDS is a state agency. Our parent agency is DARS, Department of Aging and Rehab Services. And this website just talks more about what we do at DDS. It's going to talk about the SOAR claims that I talked about earlier. It's going to talk about um, authorized representatives. These are lawyers or advocacy groups who work with the claims to kind of help them with their disability application. Um, it's going to kind of go over more about what we do at DDS if, you, if you're interested in that. Yes, I have a question. So if I were to appeal and lose the appeal, I went through the whole appeal process and lost, and then I reapply, would I be able to use the previous information and diagnosis during that process? Definitely. You can use all that prior information that we've already obtained, yes. Mm -hmm. So when someone puts out an application for benefits um, and it comes to your desk, do you look at all applications and then require the, the additional work to support it, to support the application? Or like at what point is it rejected without you seeing it? That would be if, if someone applies for benefits and you mean and you're saying DDS doesn't even look at it and send it back at what situation would that be? Are you talking about the, the process in which the person initially applies for benefits and right. Social Security say you are technically denied? Right, so it doesn't reach your office. Okay. And right, it, that will be with Social Security at any point that the individual doesn't meet the insured status or the individual doesn't meet the eligibility that would have a factor of eligibility. So and so we will have to actually look at the person or whether if the person is applying for SSDI, that person has to be insured to be able to apply for disability. If the person is applying for SS, SSI, the person doesn't need to have any work history or any insured status. It has to meet the eligibility for incoming resources. So at that point, we will look at all that and determine whether the person is eligible under this one or under the other one. Okay. So that will be something that we call a technical denial that we do in our offices. But, you know, it could be that the person later on, that situation may change and becomes insured, or the person actually doesn't have those large, you know, resources or income, and then we can deal with that situation and send another application. That person can reapply again. Yes, ma'am. If you get to the uh, administrative law judge of the appeals process, is a lawyer required to appear before an ALJ? Well, to be very honest with you, we don't market, you know, having an attorney or which one or which not. What I will actually will recommend the person to actually hire somebody who can actually represent that individual <laughs> and can actually interpret the policies and the laws because things can change. And it's important to have somebody who can represent you at that process. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, 
My daughter's a 16 year old in the ninth grade. So when I spoke to the director of special education for Fairfax County, she said I would apply right now and I applied through the community service board of Falls Church. Is that they sent me a big packet, I filled it all out and sent it back. And then she said, okay, you realize that everything goes on basis of need. It sounds to me like what you applied for maybe was a Medicaid waiver and not Social Security benefits. Okay. Um, the Medicaid waiver is a bundle of support services for things like in-home care, supports on the job, residential support, things of that nature that are available regardless of age to people with developmental disabilities. And we've got tons of information on that, but I can send people as a follow-up to this too. But um, sort of intersects at a certain point with Social Security benefits, but the application process are different and it's a different kind of support, where Social Security is a cash benefit, waiver is support services. Mm -hmm. So when, because she has, uh, I would say moderate to severe intellectual disabilities, when would I apply for Social Security mm -hmm. for her? You can apply now. Yeah, okay. anyone that's eligible from one day old, because babies can apply as well. If they have some serious physical issues or really severely low birth weight, they can apply as well. So anyone can apply for Social Security benefits. Okay. This, the hook, I would note, for most families tends to be the income piece. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, income and resources. So if the child, if, if you're looking at whole family income and mm -hmm. resources if the child's under 18, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the front. Um, two questions. If I could get a high level understanding of the difference between the long term disability waivers, like how they, the, the public pieces fit together versus social security. Mm -hmm. And my second question is when does the individual become independent from the family? In other words, I have a 17 and a half year old and I received a letter from. Medicaid waiver saying, hey, you got to talk to Social Security now. But Social Security has given me a couple different responses. Right now, I think it's based on the family income, resources, assets, things like mm -hmm. that. And then one, one said you can apply the day they turn 18, and someone else told me 18 days and 18 years old and 30 days. Okay, this is when they become. A separate entity. Yes. That and is how correct. does guardianship does the guardianship affect that whole No, guardianship doesn't okay. um, affect anything. What is happening is that throughout the month that the child is actually eighteen, okay. let's assume that the child is eighteen on August the first, right? So all throughout the month of August that child is going to be considered a dependent of the parents for all throughout the month. Okay. Immediately September 1st comes, that child is no longer 18 independent on the parents. So the parents' income, the deeming, does not apply to that child. So you want to apply for that child who turns 18 the month after the month that they turn 18. So that means so he's 18 in August the 1st. So all throughout August, that person is not going to be eligible for a society if the person has higher income and resources, right? So on the 1st of September, that child will be eligible for a society. So, so it's a little bit confusing sometimes when you talk to the 1-800 number. In that scenario, that's when you need to go Exactly. Online, if it's the first day that that child is no longer within the month of G turns 18, that child is eligible. So it could be that you can uh, apply it on the 1st of September, the 18th of September, the 20th of September, as long as it's not within the month that that child turns 18. And then it's only after that application process starts to go through through this that it hits for determination. Correct. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So the super highest level overview, the difference between waivers and Social Security is Social Security is a cash benefit you receive every month. Okay. You can use it to pay rent, you can use it to buy food, that's what it's there for. Waivers are services. You would sit down with a support team and say, I want some, a personal care attendant to come to my house on these days. I want supports on the job on these days. I want supports to do these things. And the waiver pays service providers to offer you those services. So there's cash benefit exclusively with Social Security, service benefit, and support benefit exclusively with waiver. Mm -hmm. Do they look at that? Do the Social Security look at those benefits that you're getting? Because they come in through, mm -hmm. you know, the Social Service boards and things like that. 
So all that is taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. If it's cash benefits that you're receiving, any type of cash benefits, then we look at that. If it's a services such as, you know, a, you have a caretaker coming to the home, you're receiving food stamps, or you're receiving any other type of services, we're not going to look at that. That doesn't count against you at all. No. And is that other form that you said, the one that the guardian uses? Oh, you're talking office? about the 1696? Yeah. The 1696 is actually an authorization for the in, an individual to act upon, to be an advocate to that person, right? To represent that person. They can actually exchange information with DDS. You can also exchange information with Social Security. Just make sure if you're a case manager um, and you're not an attorney charging for fees, that at the end of that form, you sign it and you waive any fees, okay? So and it could be a parent, a parent who has an 18-year-old. If you don't have guardianship, you can sign the 1696, okay? If you have guardianship, then you don't need it. You don't need it. You really don't need it. If you have guardianship through the courts, absolutely. You don't need it. So the only way to get around you making too much money for services, but, but not enough to provide services, is to wait for child turns 18? Well, if you make too much money for Social Security purposes, okay, for SSI, then you're, gonna, you're not going to be eligible. And I don't know whether the state can provide you any other type of services. We don't get involved in what services can. But we determine, you know, whether you're eligible for SSI, and SSI will make you eligible for Medicaid. So I'm not sure whether there's any services. Yeah, that unless someone receive, received a waiver, not just gets on a waiting list, but receives a waiver prior to 18, the Medicaid income eligibility is going to mirror what Social Security is saying, right? So you're not going to be eligible for either until the person is 18 if whole family income doesn't get there. But parents, I should say family income and assets are never counted when applying for a waiver. So if a three-year-old applies for a Medicaid waiver to get those supports and services in the home, they're going to look at the income and assets of the three-year-old. And that's one way that Medicaid waivers and Social Security are very different. Medicaid waivers under never, ever, 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 ever look at income and assets of the whole family. They don't care. Social Security does until the person is 18. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have a seminar on... We have 5,000 seminars on waivers, truly. I will send out links to them. Three-minute videos, handouts, long page, short page, hour and a half webinars, this kind of equivalent, many fold over. It's one of our most common questions, and I'll make sure that as I send the, the um, follow-up information for this out to folks, that I'll link to some of that, too, so that you can get to it. a specific waiver or a specific one on as they turn 18, because I understand that there's been there's no determination. So that's a, that's a kind of a disability determination issue that's more in line with Social Security. And this is what I had initially contacted mm -hmm. you about. But um, in terms of Medicaid waiver eligibility, age is not a factor. 18 is not a factor in eligibility or accessing any particular kind of waiver or service. That's not what I've been told. So it's different in terms of looking at um, I'm told that, you have, that I have to get a Social Security determination. Of so that's not accessing a waiver service. That's a Social Security determination, right? Prior to yep. turning 18 for the waiver that she's on. Right. So that has nothing to do with when. You, like, you can't hit that. You can't, you can't access that if you're not found eligible in Social Security. And if the family income is being evaluated prior to 18, yeah. I can't get a determination from you because I can't even get to that point. So this is, yeah, the is sticking that point okay. that we had worked on earlier this year and we had just put out a handout on it. So DMAS had put out a rule and a, med a memo in March maybe of this year that said starting July 1 of 2019, if you were one of the people who had a Medicaid waiver prior to age 18, that you would no longer have a grace period year between 18 and 19 to receive Social Security benefits that before you turned 18, like the 90 days before you turned 18, you had to go through this disability determination process. And that's what I would reached out to Vita for initially saying, oh my goodness, what are we going to tell people to do? So I'll let you speak to that. But kind of for background context for people in the room, this is a very new change that started in July 1 of this year. That's what my, that's what my daughter's Medicaid long-term disability waiver is separate from you guys is yeah. saying. And so if you have any handouts or anything on that, yeah, we can speak to that, but you could probably speak to that a little bit um, more. And so it's that process where someone prior to 18 is essentially filling out the same forms you would at 18 mm -hmm. and submitting them 
to apply to say by me this year, between 18 and 19, when I will be applying. Because at 18, I'll apply for regular Social Security benefits. And you're saying, give me that year, between 18 and 19, to get those benefits in place. And I'm buying myself that year by both turning in these Social Security determination documents right before I turn 18 to say, buy me this year to get through the process, and right after I turn 18 to actually apply for Social Security, which is very, very strange and cumbersome as far as I can tell for no particular benefit to anybody. So um, really yes. having to yes. But that's what this is said, that they are looking, and this is kind of the, the loophole that CDS has been having to work through as I understand it is they are looking at the documentation of this child 17 years and 9 months, let's say, because we're looking at the 90 days before they turn 18. They are looking at that and saying, on the day of their 18th birthday, if I look at the documentation we have now, on the day of their 18th birthday, would they be eligible? And if so, that buys them that year. So they're essentially having to use adult rules on a child just for those 90 days before. You're not getting Social Security benefits as a result. You're just being allowed to keep your waiver for one year so that at 18 you can apply for Social Security, you can have it in place by 19, and your Medicaid waiver can continue on. And it used to be that you didn't have to fill out that extra paperwork and jump through that extra hoop, but the rules changed, like we said, July of this year. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you get into that pipeline? So that's the, it's the same paperwork that you're filling out for but Social Security. Oh, yes. I can't get through her office, it never gets sent to your office. Are you supposed oh, to apply yeah. for Medicaid apart it's from Social Security? Like doing a determination for Medicaid? It's the determination that Medicaid is having people with waiver exclusively do under age 18 to keep their waiver once they turn 19. And you're right, it's the, for the sake of keeping Medicaid. Yeah. Mm. But I know that's not so social security yes. respect, you know. If the child, the parents have, you know, excess income and resources for us to like purposes, then that person will not be eligible for us to even forward it to the uh, Disability Determination Office, so I don't know whether there is a... Uh, it's the um, Department of Social Services that's acting as the go-between. So okay. if you have a waiver prior to 18, you have a caseworker at the Department of Social Services who every year makes you reapply for Medicaid, makes you redetermine your assets as a child, makes you do all these kinds of things, they are receiving it. And that what gets you around the Social Security system where initially it goes to someone who's looking at incomes and assets. That Department of Social Services person is then saying, this is this person who falls in this loophole. This three months before you turn 18, and you have a waiver, the only people to whom this applies for, then I will receive the application first, even though it's Social Security paperwork. <laughs> they will receive it first. They will say, this is the right person. This is the reason they turned this paperwork in, and they will route it through the back door to the Department of Disability okay. Services. Okay. Disability Determination Services. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know what those are? Are they... Yeah, and that's what's linked on the handout that I can send out along with this. But it, it's Social Security forms. It's the same kind of forms that Vita's been talking about where you're kind of looking at name, address, medical history, those kinds of things. So keep a copy, and then one month later, use them once you're 18 to apply for Social Security because it's the same thing. They're just using it two different ways. One way they're using it to keep your Medicaid. The other way they're using it to keep your Social Security benefits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm hear what I'm hearing you say, hopefully, is that if you know that income resources are in excess of whatever limit is there for SSI, that you should be going the other way and getting a waiver so that then before you turn 18, then you go to SSI regardless of income and resource. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Social Security, you're never eligible for Social Security. Just income and assets are never disregarded under the age of 18, whether or not you have a waiver. doesn't matter. Waiver services disregard your income and assets for you to get the support staff person. Mm -hmm. Social Security never disregards it for you to get the cash benefit until you're 18. And so that's one of the big differences between waiver and Social Security. Waiver rules really are not any different for people over and under 18, whereas Social Security always are. And Social Security doesn't have, care if you have a waiver. <laughs> you don't get Social Security when you're younger or older. It's income and assets always considered until you're 18. Mm -hmm. Does Medicaid that my child receives as a waiver is different than the Medicaid she will receive when she's SSI eligible. There are two different types, weird question, there are two different types of Medicaid. <laughs> One is regular state plan Medicaid. For income reasons, the whole family qualifies for health insurance through Medicaid. 
that is different than waiver Medicaid, which includes all those same health insurance benefits, but on top of it will pay for a care attendant, nursing, support to the job, all those kinds of extra things. So if you have a waiver as a child, you're getting that long-term care Medicaid, and if you have a waiver as an adult, you're getting that long-term care Medicaid. So her Medicaid will be the same regardless of age because it's waiver Medicaid. And then, I mean, again, if we were of the income asset level that qualifies for straight Medicaid, that's something different. And that would be different. So if you're qualifying for Medicaid just because of whole family income and assets, you don't get those extra pieces, which is why your average person using Medicaid can't get a job coach and can't get in home care staff and can't get changes to their house or all those extra kinds of things that waiver folks can. So some of us on the waiver Medicaid, are there other waivers that they're not getting? The, I don't want to go too far down the waiver rabbit hole because it's like a whole separate thing, but in short, Virginia has two kinds of waivers. <laughs> waivers for people with developmental disabilities and then, and then including intellectual disabilities, and then a waiver for people who have some kind of disability plus a significant medical need. That second kind of waiver doesn't have a waiting list. It's by and large aimed at people being diverted from nursing homes, so by and large aimed at people aging in place, but sometimes if you have a developmental disability and significant medical needs, you can get it even though you're much younger than the average user. Any other questions? Do we have a question? I think you're going to cover it. <laughs> As we transition to Millie, um, I'll get I'll let her kind of like get up and going here. I don't want to take too long a break because for folks on the phone it's hard, but it's like this is a good time to like go grab a, a sip of water, head out of our suite and down the hall if you need to use the restroom really quickly, and we'll kind of yeah. chit chat here and get her up and running. Um, if you want to take a minute to do that, and you won't miss anything super exciting. <laughs> Well, she's running down the hall. Do, do any folks have any kind of other quirky waiver intersection questions we can try and tackle right now? I can't, I can't read it. My vision. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is exactly the change that happened as of July 1 this year that it used to be, and I used to be a case manager for people with waivers, and as soon as they turned 18, I used to say, you're given a grace period for one year. We just have to make sure Social Security agrees that you have a disability by the time you're 19. And your waiver and your Medicaid will float along between the day you turn 18 and the day you turn 19. But on your 19th birthday, we used to say, Social Security will check and make sure you're in both systems. And if you're not, you get the boot. Now they're saying, we're not giving you that floating grace period year. Again, this only applies if you have a waiver under 18. If you're on the waiting list, you can ignore this. If you haven't applied for a waiver, you can ignore this. But if you actually have a waiver in your hands and you are using services before you turn 18, you should be getting a letter exactly like this from the what Department of Social Services in most localities, what Fairfax calls the Department of Family Services that says, hey, you know, we usually do your annual Medicaid renewal, but this year you're about to turn 18, so something odd is happening now. Starting July 1 of 2019, <coughs> right before your 18th birthday, we're having you fill out paperwork. It's going to say Social Security. You're going to give it to us at the Department of Social Services. And instead of this paperwork actually applying for Social Security benefits for you, it is buying you one year grace period. It is buying you one year from age 18 until you're 19. And you're supposed to use that year just like you always did to apply for Social Security. It's just that they used to give you that year with you doing nothing, and now you have to get paperwork to buy yourself that year. So essentially you're saying this is an expensive that they built into the system to try to get people to fill out these paperwork. It's not an incentive because no matter what, you had to fill it out at 18? Yeah, exactly, but it just seems convoluted. It is convoluted. It's convoluted. convoluted. It's yes. <laughs> that is somehow helping, no offense, helping you guys make sure your job is being done. Well, not me at the Arkham Northern Virginia, but yeah, yeah. 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 Then the individual we started receiving supplemental security income at 19, they could potentially still get booted off of Medicaid 
as my daughter did, mm -hmm. because the two systems weren't talking to one another. Mm -hmm. So Social Security, SSA, and then DDS couldn't talk, so you still got booted off. This way, it's a way to potentially preempt that problem of losing Medicaid at the age of 19 and not having to scramble and then contact the support coordinator and everybody else to say, oh my God, put my child back on because we were just at the doctors today and I they need to be picking up that bill. They didn't send any forms. Yep. And they just basically said, if you don't do something by the time she's turned 18, we will lose all the nursing coverage. Yeah. And that's really a nice little panic on Friday. <laughs> so, not the most helpful way to do things. I am super glad that you're here. And anyone who attends today, like I said, I'll send that two-page handout. We will talk about what we talked about today, exactly this. You used to be having a grace period of a year. Now you don't. And it will have the links to forms. Again, Solely thanks to the people in this room that we finally have our hands on that you'll determine to your caseworker at Department of Family Services and say, here you go. This buys me my year. Mm -hmm. So this letter and that concern are for people who already younger than 18 people who have the DD waiver? Any waiver. Any waiver. Okay. Any waiver. In Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Millie, do you want to take it away? <laughs> and she's going to help me with that because I like to walk around the room and I want to make it interactive with all of you, okay? So my name is Millie Rockwell, and I don't, I'm putting here my email, but if you notice, it will be milagros.rockwell at ssa.gov. So if you have any questions, please email me. It's okay to email me. It is not okay to send me social security numbers, date of birth, or name. Please give me your cell phone and say, hey, I, I saw you at this you know, meeting or whatever it is. Can I ask you a question? Yes, indeed. You can ask me any question, and I will return a call to you, okay? Uh, I am what is called the Area Working Center Coordinator for the Area 3, so I oversee uh, West Virginia, Maryland, Virginia, and um, D.C. So my office is actually in the D.C. Um, location, so, uh, but I help everybody. I am in contact with my 14 offices, and I'm here to help you guys. I wanted to ask a question. How many of you are managers, case managers? Process cases or help individuals in the community? How many of you are parents? I guess the majority of you guys. Oh my God, this is awesome. This is awesome. Okay, so it's going to be different because you know normally and usually when I do a presentation, I want to make sure that I actually address the audience and also the case managers who potentially are going to be helping your children. Okay, so let's take it away. And that's my phone number. You can call me. Okay. It's actually in the uh, PowerPoint presentation and the paperwork in there, okay? So as Vida mentioned, disability is very is specific for Social Security. Um, it has to have, at least if not, a duration of 12 months or more, or eventually will cost your death. Also, that person has to have a severe medical condition, okay? So it's not like, you know, your pinky, you twisted your pinky or something like that. That's not sufficient enough to really, you know, file a disability claim with Social Security. The other one that is very, very important is that the person actually has to have, if not, if the person is actually engaging in what is called substantial gainful activity. And Social Security describes that or defines that by an individual who can actually earn more than 1220 per month. And that's that is gross amount. However, don't get discouraged by that definition because we have individuals who are disabled and they're working, but they're also are paying for medications out of pocket. They're also paying for transportation, and they're paying for things. If you're having some type of expenses, out of pocket expenses, we can actually take that into consideration to reduce that, what is called a substantial gainful activity, okay? So that's a little bit complex, of course, to understand, but Please feel free that when you have a disabled individual, whether it's a child, an adult, please come to Social Security and apply for disability. Let us look at your case individually and let us make a decision for you, okay? So don't always go with what it says in here because there's also deviations from those definitions, okay? So I want to make sure that I do that disclaimer before anything else, okay? But um, if you have an individual who's making 2000 a month, it has no out-of-pocket expenses, nothing else, guess what, that person is not going to be eligible for disability even if that person has a severe impairment, okay? So we have to look at those earnings, and you have to have the company all that together, that package together, okay? All right, so we have two programs at, with Social Security. We have what is called the uh, SSDI, 
So I'm going to call it all throughout this presentation Title II, okay? So Title II and SSDI is Title 16. So for SSDI, Title II, the person has to be working and earning and paying Social Security. So you're paying taxes, right? So you are becoming what is called insure in the later time if you become disabled for disability payment. It's just like anything else. You have a car insurance, you hit somebody, that, that insurance that you're paying is going to be able to pay the other person and also repair your car. Same thing, same concept with Social Security. Um, if you have a stay-at-home mom, if you guys know anybody who's a stay-at-home mom, keep in mind if that person has stopped working for more than 10 consecutive years, that person has lost what is called the insurance, insurance status with Social Security. So make sure if you have friends and family, please pass the word around that at least you know if you can get a part-time job when you get a chance, that's important, okay, because you don't want to be applying for SSI and having a husband who makes pretty large income and not be able to qualify for neither one of the programs, okay? So I was a stay-at-home mom for a long, long time, and when I started working for Social Security, I find out a hard way that I have to start working and making pretty good money, right, to be able to be insured. So I find out, you know, the hard way that, you know, we have to start working, okay, to become insured. <laughs> it, is, it is, unfortunately. For disabled individuals, for disabled individuals, we understand that. That's one of the reasons why Social Security has to SSI. For those individuals who are not required to actually have any type of work history or earnings. That's for this program right here, the SSDI, is for those people who are workers and they actually work. So to, to become insured, you have to actually have at least, if not out of the 10 years, five years of work, okay? So are you saying that if they go back to work after not being employed for 10 years, that they're... No, if you actually... benefits will somehow become... No, because whatever you work in the past, it's already there for you to retire in the future. You go back to work. After 10 years of being absent from working, then after five years, you become insured. So you're still going to be young and healthy to continue working and earning, okay? So when it comes to supplemental security income, you don't really have to work. You really don't have to do that. That's not a requirement. It's actually a federal program. It's an needs-based program. So that means that anybody can apply. A baby, if you have a baby who's a low birth baby, the hospital is going to send us a leave and we are going to proceed with an application for that child. If you have a parent who's 65 years old and has never worked or doesn't have enough quarters, then we are actually going to take an application and that person potentially is eligible for SSI. Same thing with in any one of us for SSI. So, so we actually um, have people, individuals who are eligible for SSI, that they're 65, babies, children, adults, or anybody. For the other one, has a little bit different criteria. You have to be insured and you have to work and pay into the system. This is pretty much the difference. So the Title II comes from a Social Security Trust Fund. That's what you're paying into the system and you pay taxes for that. So Supplemental Security Income is a separate funding and it's actually a needs-based program. Um, so to, I just went over this. Um, so the most important thing I will say that if a lot of you are thinking about applying for SSI, either for yourself or your children, the only thing is that SSI takes into consideration income and resources. And of course, living arrangements. And that's something that's a little bit more complex, you know, when it comes to that. Um, this one right here can benefit, you know, children, adults, or anybody, even uh, an aged individual. Also, with the SSI program, we also have benefits that is payable to those people who are outside these refugees and other lawful permanent residents in, in the United States. So they have to meet certain criteria when it comes to this program. Keep in mind that I don't make the law, I just apply it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, when can you apply for disability? Now, today, yesterday, you should have been applying for disability if you're thinking about that. Of course, if you have an 18-year-old, that means that you know now that the month that he turns 18, you don't want to apply for SSI. You want to apply the month after he turns or he or she turns 18. Uh, so we actually prefer that you guys apply online. However, the SSI application, the entire SSI application is not online. But you can apply and it's going to ask you for three questions about SSI. You answer yes to that or you answer those questions and you proceed with the application. Even though that the child is 18 years old or somebody's, you know, if it's an adult, you can apply. If it's a child, 
the only thing that you can apply online, it will be the disability form. The only thing that you can submit will be the disability report. And you can do that. If you have a child who's under 18 and you think that you may be able to be eligible for SSI, don't worry about it. Just send the application to us. We will determine whether you are or not, okay? But you can apply and complete the disability report for the child. Same thing for the adults. You can apply it, you know, online too as well. Let us do our job. If you apply it online and we see that you have applied online, that gives you also protective filing for our purposes. And if we see, you, see it in there, we ask, we don't send you a letter or close file letter, guess what? We're going to have to protect you all the way back to that date that you filed. Okay? So that's important. I will actually prefer the online because it's recorded, it's there, and we know that you apply. We have a date in there. It's stands. So this is the preferred method, of course. If you don't feel comfortable completing the process online, don't worry about it. Call the 100 number and schedule an appointment over the phone or in person. If you're one of those people who wants to come in to Social Security, you might guess, come in. It's busy, mm -hmm. and <laughs> but if you have an appointment, they're going to call you at the time of the appointment, okay? Make sure you keep that appointment, okay? If not, you can call them and say reschedule for another time. They're still going to protect you from the day that you contact Social Security, okay? That's very important for us. So what happened next? So you apply online, we receive the application, we're going to review everything in there. If we have a question, we're going to call you, we're going to say, hey, by the way, can you explain this to me? What does it mean? If we have any questions, then we're going to complete that process with you over the phone. Make sure that if you do apply for disability, you send something online. If we contact you, we send you a letter, act promptly. And make sure to contact us and let us know. This is very important because time is consuming, you know. This process is very consuming. DDS actually can take up to six months to render a decision. So if we take, you know, 90 days to 100 days to be able to complete the application process, then you are prolonging that uh, process. So, okay, so when it comes to, when it goes to the estate agency, they're going to do what they have to do. There are also the state agency, uh, the uh, Disability Determination Office will send you some forms. Um, any forms that, they, that you guys receive, make sure that you complete that form, you send it back to DDS because they really need that information. So, and that also delays also the process if we don't complete that. Um, very important to do that, okay? Um, DDS will request the medical records, whatever it is. Keep in mind that if you have younger children and they have an IEP, um, please come, you know, bring us some copies of that. Anything from the school, psychological evaluations or anything like that, please provide us with that information. That's very important. If you have it on hand, you know, make copies, bring it over to the uh, interview or send it over to us, okay? And we will send it to the yes. so paperwork is very important because we want to know a third party, a teacher, a psychologist, what do they think about your child? How do they see this child? It's very important, okay? And I want to also add, um, especially in the summertime, in the beginning of the school year and the end of the school year, we have a lot of trouble getting records from the school because their school's closed or they're busy. So that would cause delays as well. So again, if you have copies of the IEP, the 504 plan, anything like that, that would be really helpful um, for us to make quickly make our medical decision. Very important. Yes. And I imagine the most recent reevaluation material from your anything that can help. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also keep in mind, because you're parents, and um, I'm a parent. I had a child also who had a medical condition. And it's very important when you guys take your children or yourself, I don't know whether you're applying for yourself, to the doctor. Often enough, the doctor writes progress notes. When you're talking to your doctor, articulate to that doctor exactly what you're feeling, because guess what? The first thing that he says to you, how are you doing? And you're going to say what? I'm good. I'm fine. That's exactly what he's going to write in your progress notes. The female, 47 years old, came to the office. She's feeling fine. I read the record medical records. I have read almost a bunch of them. So I said, okay, make sure you are honest with your doctor and you say, listen, my leg is hurting, my back is hurting, my mind is going crazy, help me out. So he can write in there, okay, I, this person presented this sentence or whatever it is. Those medical records are read by the medical determination examiners, and they are actually going to go by what the doctor says, right? So your doctor is saying one thing to you, but it's writing something else in your report, you know. So make sure you do. You will make sure you tell that person that how you feel. Express that to them. It's very important. <coughs> 
Okay, so after it's sent to the uh, DDS, they're actually going to return either an allowance or a denial, right? So if there's an allowance, we're going to send you a letter. We're going to talk to you if, if it's less than 120 days. We, Social Security, are not even going to contact you. Your application is done, less than 120 days, we're going to put you into base. We're going to process your claim if it's less than 120 days. If it takes longer than that, we're going to have to recontact you back and talk to you. This is for SSI purposes, okay? Um, when it comes to the other one, SSDI, which is Title II for adults, that one, they're going to put you into pay no matter what, because that one has no, nothing involving income, resources, or living arrangements, nothing like that. But when it comes back, if it's less than 120 days, we're going to put you into pay, okay? If it's denied, I'm going to tell you this, do not just take that lightly. It's going to give you 60 days to appeal. Go ahead and do that. Appeal that decision. If you disagree, contact Social Security immediately. Say, hey, I, wanted to, uh, I want an appeal, paperwork. If not, you have the ability, if you're an adult, to apply and submit the appeals online. You can do that. If you're a child, make sure you send that paperwork. Make a copy of the first page or whatever page where they stamp that they have received your application. Very important because guess what? What happens to papers? When did you drop it? They cannot find paperwork, right? right? So keep a copy of all your paperwork if you're going to submit it on paper for yourself. And when they actually say, I don't have your paperwork, I say, yeah, here it is. Somebody sign it. Here's the date. Guess what? They have to protect you. That's important on the application. Because that's time. That's your time. And if we don't do what, I have, what we have to do and we fail to do something for you, guess what? We're going to correct it. We're going to do the right thing for you. We're going to do that, but you have to present some proof, okay? Well, you know, uh, I think we already went through this. If you're an adult, you can do it online. You can do it over the phone in person and things like that. So they have no restrictions, you know, pretty much on anything when it comes to that. The only thing when you are an adult with a society will be the income and resources. If you're a lawful permanent resident or something like that, if you're applying under those basis of being an asylee, refugee, parolee, or anything like that, uh, we do want to see your lawful permanent resident paperwork and things like that, okay? <coughs> For getting into site, of course, you know, we already went through this, income resources, uh, living arrangement, of course, is something that we're going to ask you. I know that you have perhaps, you know, 18-year-old kids, and guess what? I know that they're living with mom and dad, but what we wanted to find out at that point when it comes to living arrangements is whether that individual is actually um, acting as self-sufficient, paying rent, or helping you to do that. I know that a lot of things with the SSI program is a little bit convoluted and very intense and intrusive. Guess what? That is something that we have to do. That is your, our job to ask you questions about income and resources and all that. So don't feel offended about, you know, when they ask you, so how many kids are in the household? How many cars did you have? How many boats and things like that? If you're applying for a child, a minor child, if you're applying for somebody who's 18 years old, we don't care about anything that parents have. We care about that individual specifically. Nothing more, nothing less for that individual. Yes, ma'am. All right, quick question. We can go back to the previous uh -huh. slide first. So to apply online, you have to also be applying for SSDI? You don't have to. You don't have to. So that's, that's an or not. A well, no. If you are applying online and you're 18 and older, you can apply. The first thing that's going to ask you to apply for SSDI, which is Title II. It doesn't matter whether you're insured or not. Go ahead and apply for that because what we do is we actually close that chapter and we do what is called a technical denial on that. You're going to receive a letter saying, hey, you don't qualify for this program because you have not had any earnings or you have zero earnings or very limited earnings. You don't have the insurance status. The online um, application is going to, all, all going to prompt you to apply for SSDI first. Then it will be three questions for SSI, and then subsequently it's going to go for the disability report, which is very important. If you as a parent are completing applications online for your adult children, Make sure that that adult children is there with you to attest to the application, to be able to also attest to the 827, which is the authorization to release information. If you don't do that and she's not available or the person is not available and you're doing it for that person, what it's going to do is going to happen is that Social Security is going to send you the application for a wet signature on that application, okay? 
So it delays a little bit the process, but it's okay. You file it online, we have it, okay? As long as you return the paperwork, we're going to be able to process your application. Of course, she mentioned before that for little children's diagnosis and things like that are very different. Of course, the rules that we talk about having a severe impairment or having a duration for 12 months and things like that not always applies to the children. Children are very different um, and diagnoses are very different. Uh, I think we went through this. Um, when it comes to SSI, anybody who actually has children or even individuals who are applying for SSI, it could be your mother, it could be your sister, it could be your brother, keep in mind that we are actually going to take in consideration earned income, which are the wages, or it could be, you know, um, uh, shelter workshops and things like that that they pay you, self-employment, the NESI. NESI is the net earning from the uh, self-employment. When it comes to unearned income, if your child is receiving um, child benefits from a parent who's receiving disability, we're going to count that. Um, we're also going to count, you know, if the person is actually an adult receiving unemployment, veterans uh, benefits, or anything that you actually are receiving this. It could be long-term, short-term disability and things of that nature. Um, the majority of the vast majority of the people that apply the adults, they apply for disability, they also have some sort of issue with work and compensation or they apply for unemployment. Keep in mind that when you're signing the unemployment paperwork, you're telling the unemployment, hey, I'm not disabled. I will be able to find a job, but pay me unemployment benefits. Guess what? We don't get involved on that. However, you're giving conflicting information, you're applying for Social Security. However, if you're receiving unemployment, we're not going to say, hey, I'm going to turn you in to the unemployment. We don't do that. Okay? But keep in mind that that's exactly what you're saying when you actually uh, receive unemployment, okay? So we also actually can also the interest, pensions, and to be honest with you, cash from family, it has to be substantial. So if your child is receiving a gift card for $100, please don't put it in the application. That's for them to spend, you know, for Christmas or birthdays or something like that, okay? So we're not going to take that in, in, into consideration. Much less we're going to actually ask you how much money is in your pocket, okay? We used to ask that question, how much did you have in your pocket? And I was like, if it's 20, you're going to spend it right after Social Security. I'm pretty sure you're going to McDonald's or you know, somewhere else to eat, okay? So we're not going to ask you that question. Things like that, you know, keep in mind that we're not going to penal penalize you for not providing that information, but that's actually uh, cash from family and friends only. It's actually substantial that they're giving you $1,000 to pay your mortgage because you cannot pay your mortgage or your rent. We're going to take that into consideration, okay? Any questions? Yes, ma'am. So I'm... Uh, my question is around, uh, my, it's for my daughter, who mm -hmm. is 18, mm -hmm. um, and I was shocked to learn that the amount of child support that I received from her father is counted as income yes, for sir. her. So where, what does that fall under? On an income. However, Unearned. for child support, we only count two-thirds of that amount. Two thirds of the total amount. The total amount should be two thirds of that. The system itself, when we take an application for somebody who's receiving child support, it will be two thirds of that amount that we actually take into consideration. Keep in mind, the SSI can only pay a maximum of seven hundred and fifty-one dollars per month. So therefore, if you are receiving twelve hundred dollars for child support, keep in mind that's going to offset almost, if not completely, the seven fifty-one that we can pay you. But that is the end of 18, right? The child support? Well, not always. Not always. Not, um, not for not a disabled always. person. Uh, in certain states like Florida, Puerto Rico, and other places, it goes into 21, age 21. That person is responsible for that child. So it will depend what the court order is. And if the child is disabled, even beyond that, it can go for a pretty long time, depending on the time. So, um, and it doesn't take into consideration how many children the child support is used for? How old is your child? My, 18. She's 18. She's 18. Okay, so if you articulated to the office or the person who actually, when you submitted the application, that the child support is actually for three children, uh -huh. then we should have it split it for three children and use the third, two thirds of that amount from that child. Okay, thank you. Back at the show. I see you, Marcelli, the Ark of Northern Virginia, in case you don't know. So you need to go back and get the court order changed to reflect the change and then have the child support irrevocably assigned to a first party special needs trust and then it does not count as income against the that, is, that is very important. Well, Another thing is that mm -hmm. first party or we call it a self -control. The one that we have with you. No. 
Oh, yeah, her family funded you. Okay. She's going to need a first party because okay. it's considered her income at 18 or older. Okay, thank you. And that's important that if you actually are going to do that, make sure that person who's writing that trust is a specifically, you know, filing the guidelines for Social Security, okay. and they can help you. They can help you, and I love that because guess <laughs> why? Uh, that's, that's important. And if you do have a trust fund, even with zero money, please provide that copy to Social Security because it takes – six months for us to be able to send it to the regional office to read it and make sure there's nothing in there that actually will preclude the individual from receiving it this site, okay? And we don't do that in our office. We have to send it out to Philadelphia to get it all. So with the Ark of Northern Virginia's trust documents, they've already been vetted at the SSA office in Philadelphia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's no concern about it not being the correct document. And that's for both trusts. That's for both trusts, but, but, but the unfunded trust, so the family funded trust is an unfunded, so there's no money in it. So they really don't need to see that document until you know you're going to be putting money into okay. it. With the first well, I gave it to them anyway, but yeah. if okay. they can have it for reading, yeah. Yeah. so it will be okay. Okay, thank you. And so you're here, they can help you. So if you guys have any questions about, you know, trust and how to write it and how to get it through, you know, get with them, okay? If you're providing respite care for your disabled individual, the state does not, it's called the care-funded wage. So they don't pull Social Security, Medicaid, federal, or state. Is that a question? Is there you an ability to pay it in for yourself? Can you ask the question one more time? Yeah, when people work respite hours and they're part of the family, um, Consumer Directed does not pull out SSI or, or they don't Social Security is not drawing. It's not drawing from that wage. Can you no. pay it in yourself so that you get credit? Or are you know. now not getting credit? I don't know. I do not know. Live-in caregivers for consumer-directed services under the waiver do not pay federal Social Security taxes. And that's the way that it should be. That's the way that the system is set up. I have never had anyone try and pay them in. Um, because they're not getting credit. So if they're right. exclusively working as a right. care provider in the home, they're not going to be able to access because they're technically not paying As an interesting question, I don't know if Social don't Security don't would take the money because they're not supposed to, right? It's not a tax. What it, what it yeah. happens is this. It, it won't matter where that money comes from. If you're self-employed and you're, you're a caretaker of somebody and you say, listen, this is my income, messy. It's a self-employed employment. So you will have to pay the taxes to be able to, for us to be able to give you credit for that. Okay? But you're not self-employed. But you're not. In this case, you're employed by the waiver. The waiver of Medicaid dollars is and paying you directly towards you, towards your income. It has to be like, for example, if you're self-employed, uh, self then you can say, hey, they're not taking taxes, I'm going to pay the taxes. Because if you're working for Blue Ridge or Walls or a number of waiver providers, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're not getting any of that. So you're then kind of off-grid as far as being able to access it yourself. If you're not paying the taxes, yeah, from Social Security, yeah, you're not going to get credit for that. Yeah. Double whammy, huh? Yeah. It's going to make you fill up on the forms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not paying the taxes, right? So you you're not getting, taking, you, don't, you guys don't take taxes, right? When they not we, the but in this case, Virginia's Medicaid office says, the federal law says if you're doing this type of job and this type of living arrangement, your income is not subject to federal taxes. So they should not be removed, right? So you're, so you're not paying taxes. taxes. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get what credit is, in those credit hours, and so therefore, what happens if you get disabled while caring for your disabled individual? Then ten years goes by, and you're not able to access your own disability benefit. So you're out of luck. Well, well you didn't pay into. But you well, didn't pay you into it it before you she started asking. Is it possible to pay you, into it despite the fact? I don't know about the okay. state, how they look at that income here, but if you file taxes, but if you've gone 10 years and you work for somebody else, I mean, if you think it's this great benefit, oh, I don't have to pay taxes on it, but it could now trip you up for... I don't know how the federal government will look at that income. I know that if you are performing a job as a 
and, and it's considered self-employment because although they hire you to do a job, you're not paying taxes. They're not taking anything from you. No taxes whatsoever. It's simply they're paying you. However, if you, I don't know, you may want to talk about Oh, they do take some taxes. To be okay. Paid. They take state taxes, but it's not subject to federal income tax. That particular okay. type of income tax. But I thought it was not subject to Social Security or Medicaid. Those are both federal taxes. Mm -hmm. Medicare and Social Security are federal. And individuals who are working for their family companies and are under the age of 18, you don't take SSI, you don't take we're not going to tell you. Well, Social Security taxes out of theirs, so they don't get credit for those. If you don't pay taxes for Social Security and Medicare, that's not going to show up in there as your right. earnings and wages or anything like that. Then I have a so. question. Um, I went to the Social Security office, showed up, went mm -hmm. through, it was determined that we have too many assets or income or whatever mm -hmm. to apply for this. I got a letter back saying I didn't show up to the appointment. How important is it to correct that? Well, it will depend. Um, sometimes Social Security, and I say because I work for Social Security, yeah. I love my agency very much, so uh, I have passion for my agency. What happens is sometimes we take the action and the letters go after, okay? So sometimes, you know, we actually take actions on your case. If you had a, a, a phone interview or you talk to somebody to the teleservices and I, you say, hey, I went into you went into there, okay, and they yeah. send you a letter, that's a close call letter. They sent a letter, but they said you didn't show up. And so I just didn't. No, if no. they told you initially that you're not going to be able to qualify for that, don't worry about it because okay. actually what they're saying is that they're supposed to be putting in there instead of sending you a close out letter that you didn't show up, it should have been saying that this person is actually exceed the income and resources. Okay. That's sure I don't think she submitted anything while I was on it. Right. She probably was talking to you. I don't want them to. I no, 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 no. That's not going to be a reflection on you negatively. No, you're fine. You're going to be fine. No. That's a close out letter. We actually want to close out those cases because if we don't send out some sort of uh, technical denial to you, then we're saying that lead is still open. We have to protect you all the way back from that time. Okay. okay. Somebody. Well, thanks. The okay. last question for now, and then we'll kind of go back to our please don't ask questions during, unless you're clarifying what's going on, because we get so far off track, and I don't want to be respectful of people's time. Mm -hmm. You can. So the unearned income is could cash from significant cash from family and friends. Does that include any kind of services from family and friends, like child care and stuff like that? So like, for example, if the person is actually uh, providing. Uh, Child care for the disabled mm -hmm. individual. Or well, that, if if my if my mother is providing child care for my child for free. No, or oh, no, that doesn't count against. Okay. She can do yeah. anything she wants with her. No. Right. No. Okay. Yeah. okay. So resources very quickly. Bank accounts. Uh, don't go in into your bank accounts right now. Okay. So the individual itself has a limit of $2,000, and the uh, couples will have $3,000, okay? Um, when you have a minor child, it will be that the child will, can have an account with $2,000, and the parents can have one with $3,000. Um, if you have a bank account that has a bunch of money because, you know, the tax return, tax returns are actually excluded for a whole year, okay? So we're going to see a lot of money in there. So you know, we're going to be able to exclude it. Just let us know that it's actually the tax returns that you receive, okay, the refund. Um, when it comes to um, if stocks and bonds, mutual funds, savings bonds, and things like that, if the child or yourself, if you're applying for yourself, if you have an excess of $2,000 liquid assets, um, they're going to count against you, okay? Um, of course, you know, when you, we exclude the first card, the home that you live in, um, we're going to exclude the burial plot. Uh, we also have able to count that also serve as, you know, savings account that you can save money for education or for medical treatment or things like that. Those are things that are excluded. So you can put money in there and we're still going to actually, as long as it's able account, we're going to be able to exclude it. Um, resources when it comes to having a plot or a family lot or something like that, we exclude all that. And there's more in the listing. Special needs trust? Yes, mm -hmm. special trust. Yes, absolutely. They're excluded as long as they have the, um, the language, you know, that we actually uh, require. Uh, when it comes to having property outside of the United States or in the United States, I have a lot of people that perhaps may have four houses and all of them are in foreclosure. So that means that you're still going to qualify. Because you cannot pay the mortgage, you cannot pay none of that, okay? And perhaps, you know, those kind of, uh, the houses or the homes are actually worth less than what you actually paid for or owe to the bank. When it comes to vehicles, if you have a handicapped van 
or vehicle that you use to transport your, you know, uh, person who's actually, you know, paraplegic or quadriplegic or things like that. We're going to exclude that vehicle. We're also going to exclude the vehicles who actually the, the parents are using for their own personal businesses. If you have a self, you're self-employed, you own a business, you know, an electric company or plumbing or something like that, we're going to exclude that. But we, in general terms, we exclude the first car. The second car, it will depend upon the value of the vehicle. If the value of the vehicle has a residual value of $2,000 or $3,000 or more, then that car, that car will make you ineligible for the exercise program. But it will depend. I have people who actually have four vehicles, but they owe every single one of them to the bank. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the market value plus what you know you owe to the bank, you are on a negative. Okay? So don't feel bad when you say, I have four vehicles, but I owe every single one. But someone's let them down. They probably will not even count it. And we're going to look at NADA the value of your vehicle, the current value of your vehicle, and we're going to be able to exclude it if we can, okay? And there's more to resources and income and things like that, so we will be able to do it at the office and uh, when you come for an appointment, okay? When it comes to living arrangements, please keep in mind if the individual is not paying rent in the house that they're living, that person is actually going to be receiving what is called a reduced benefit rate, which is, you know, two-thirds of the 751. Um, if you are in a hospital, if you're a baby, you're a low birth weight baby, or you're a person who has been permanently put in a hospital or something like that, you only can receive $30, but you're going to be eligible for a okay? At that point, if the person is actually in an institution in a hospital, if you are in the care of the hospital, we're not going to count any income or deeming or anything like that. It's going to be flat out $30 that you're going to be receiving. Um, and we will determine all that when you come to the office and you actually apply. We will go through all that process and we we'll explain why we're doing what we're doing, the questions that we're asking. When it comes to the society and homeless, I believe that Vida uh, already explained that we actually are uh, almost a liaison for the SOAR program. And we actually care a whole lot about this. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing for everybody. Okay? And uh, those cases take you know, priority also too for um, the Disability Determination Office, and it takes social priority with us, too. How to apply for underage, which we already know that underage, the SSI application is not online. You will have to make an appointment either over the phone or in person, and we'll be able to take the application on, uh, over the phone or in person. The with disability report, you can do it online, okay? Medicare and Medicaid. What's the difference between the two of them? If you're eligible for SSI, the likelihood is that you're going to be eligible for Medicaid, okay? Um, eventually, the decision is actually with the state, but if they see that you actually are receiving even $1 from SSI, you will be eligi eligible for Medicaid. When it comes to Medicare, Medicare for Title II, which is SSDI, you will be able to receive Medicare after 24 months of receiving disability payments, okay? Unfortunately, I don't know who selected 24 months, but that's the way it is. I wish it would have been actually immediately when they get your benefits, because guess what? Who's going to pay for your medical expenses? I didn't make the law. I'm just explaining it to you guys. I wish it would change, because guess what? A lot of people need this right here. They need Medicare right away. That's what the reason why they're with us. Um, However, there's other circumstances that can change that outcome, and those are, those are things that we work behind the scenes. When I say when you call and you submit something to us, you are protected. And when we say that we're, if we deny you at the initial determination, continue that process. Because even if it takes one year or two years to get that decision, guess what? We can take you back retroactively, and also your Medicare will be also, um, you will be eligible much sooner for Medicare, okay? Ooh, this is a little bit more complex. After the individual is actually receiving disability, whether it's SSI or whether it's SSDI, Social Security provides what is called work incentive, and that is that we want the individual to feel self-sufficient. We want that individual to know that they can work and we would like them to actually get back to the society and get a job and feel really fulfilled. So we have a lot of programs when it comes to work incentive. So that means that if you're receiving disability and you call Social Security and say that you're working, that's when they are showing say, oh, great, we're going to do a work report and we're going to review you based on work. So that means that Social Security is going to give you nine, nine months a trial work period. 
if you earn more than $880 for the year of 2019, then you will be actually fulfilling that, you know, period, the trial work period. If you make under that, then you actually have not yet served the trial work period. However, um, we also have what is called extended period of eligibility. So after the trial work period, and there's a lot of wonderful things that we provide to you guys to make sure that you can keep your Social Security, your Medicare, and also can continue to work. At that point, we actually going to um, we encourage the individuals to actually keep receipts for taxi, transportation, medical expenses, anything that you have, keep receipts of all that. Okay, so we can be able to actually say, hey, that person is actually has out of pocket expenses. That person is going from point A to point B, and we will be able to actually provide you an exclusion out of your income from that. Okay. So those are things that we uh, Social Security wants to provide the disabled individuals. So, and that's my, my expertise. That's what I actually do, and that's what I actually, I, the entire, I train everybody around the, uh, the region to be able to actually provide those incentives to the disabled individual. We want them to be able to feel self-sufficient, go to college, get a job, whatever it is that you guys want to do. We want to be able to promote that. You can get one. Make sure that if you do start if you start working and um, you want to get in contact with, if you call the ticket to work, you will be able to get in contact with somebody who's an employment um, authorized person from Social Security. And these individuals actually are going to help you to complete any type of form, get you where you need to be, uh, give you orientation and things like that. If you are participating in what is called the ticket to work and any support, you know, as I said, employment, um, especially the ticket to work, you're not going to be actually be, you're going to be exempt to what is called the medical review, which the medical review is saying that if a person has, you know, a disabling condition but is able to improve their medical, if they're expecting to be improved at a later time, then we're going to do a medical review, we're going to send it to the medical determination office, and they're going to render a decision to see whether you actually, your condition has better over the past the few years, okay? So, but if you're in the ticket to work, you really will be protected from those medical reviews, okay? You will not be protected from the work because the work is going to give you a lot of incentives. We're going to provide you with a lot of incentives. So you, so you can actually stay working, keep your Medicare, and continue to receive Social Security disability, okay? Well, this is a little bit more complex. Uh, Basically, if you are actually self-employed, keep in mind that uh, there is a concept about what is called substantial gainful activity. Substantial gainful activity, activity plays a huge role in here, and that is if the individual finds a job and the person is getting paid, you know, more than $1,200, $1,220 per month, then the individual um, is actually engaging in substantial. However, the work incentive is going to help you to be able to reduce those earnings, meaning if you have expenses, if you have um, out-of-pocket medical um, expenses and things like that, we can be able to take a, into consideration that, okay? If you have somebody like a helper, you have, for example, a coach, um, um, a job coach, or you have somebody who's helping you, let's assume that you get hired at a factory or somewhere, and you have somebody who is a coach, job coach, and that person is doing your, your job 50% of the time. Guess what? You're being subsidized 50% of the time, so we're going to actually make sure that out of those $1,200, you actually are basically working half of that, okay? So we're going to take that into consideration. So uh, it's important for you to be able to have an open communication with Social Security and be able to articulate those things to us. And case managers, you know, they actually do a great job helping with that, okay? I don't know whether you have case managers for employment um, networking uh, here. We have support coordinators for waivers on here who help find. Find, okay. So if you do have any questions when it comes to that, you know, make sure you contact, you know, for example, them, or, you know, if you wanted to contact me and send me an email, Millie, Millie, what is it, what is, how do I go about this? I will definitely will send you some more guidance when it comes to this. This is very complex, and I'm not a lot of people are able to to explain that. It's not easy to explain it in a presentation when I have to go through every single little detail on this. But this is a, a, something very positive that came out of Social Security to help all the disabled individuals. So not everything is really bad. And this also applies also for SSI and SSDI. So both titles are entitled to that. Okay? Mm -hmm. At any given point, you can, you can get into it. 
at any given point when you're actually working and receiving disability that we actually have what is called an extended period of eligibility. That means that you can actually be working and maybe a couple of months you're going to be what is called SGA, substantially earning, right? If you don't have any expenses or anything to deduct, we're going to suspend you, but you also have the ability to come back and say, hey, can you reinstate me? My earnings are going down. I'm working less hours, and we can do that. For 36 months, we can do that for you, okay? After the 36 months, if you are engaging in SGA, which is making more than 1,220, we are actually going to, going to terminate your benefits. However, it doesn't stop right there. Because even if we terminate your benefits and you continue to work, what if you, your condition gets worse? Guess what? You can come back to Social Security and we're going to do what is called an um, immediate reinstatement. Okay? So they can do that for you. And they can put you on the same pay and they also can give you six months uh, of provisional payment. Okay? So there's some wonderful things. This is actually what I was talking about. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of good things coming out of this, and that is that you have nine months to try to see whether you can work. At uh, this period in here, we're going to actually look for $880, whether you can make that amount, okay? And once you enter into the extended period of, period of eligibility, at that point you have 36 months in here where we're going to suspend, reinstate, suspend and reinstate. And we're going to do that. All you have to do is pick up the phone and let us know. And if you are in this area, that's what I overlook. I look at everybody, all those offices, to make sure that they do this for you guys. So everybody has a hope. And this is very complex. Um, so it is what it's called. Um, there's certain other things that we apply. When you're working, we also can apply what it's called on successful work attempts. That means the individual tries to work. And that can be applied only on the EPE. Let's assume that you completed your TWP, which is a trial work period, nine months, teaching, you earn pretty good. You enter into the extended period. If you are, you stop working suddenly within three months of that year, we can actually consider that on successful work attempt. It's very really complex, don't worry. We will do it behind the scenes for you. But there's a lot of things that we apply you know, to make sure that you continue to receive those benefits and we don't charge you with an overpayment. I often, when I receive, um, the majority of the case managers are pretty good to contact me and say, hey, no, can you check this out? Is this decision correct? If it's an overpayment, I'm going to be able to look at it and say, hey, that's incorrect. You need to reopen that. And we actually going to overturn that, you know, overpayment. We're going to do it ourselves, okay? So we do a lot of things behind the scenes for the disabled individual, and I want you to know that this is available. We, it's very complex, but we are actually, we're here to actually explain it behind the scenes. You send me an email if you want to know a little bit more about that, okay? This is actually what I was talking about before, that if you have expensive, you can deduct it from your earnings. So don't think that because you're earning $1,500 gross amount per month, Generally speaking, it will be 1220 But if you have other expenses that we can take into consideration, we will be able to deduct that and bring you down to less than the substantial gainful activity. But you have to be able to articulate that to us and let us know during the application process. This can be applicable to into the initial stages when you apply for disability. So you come to us and you're working. So that doesn't mean that you cannot be working when you apply for disability. You can be working, but let us know whether you have a job coach. Let us know if you're working for Safeway or Walmart where they provide you subsidies. Subsidy means that they allow you to rest for 30 minutes longer than somebody else. So all those things we take into consideration. So let us know so when we take your initial application, we don't deny you right off the bat. We need to know that. There's a lot of children, a lot of individuals who are working for Safeway, um, service stores perhaps, or some other uh, companies that provide subsidies. They hire a lot of disabled individuals. If they provide subsidies, we're going to obtain that information. You can tell us, and we will send a form to them. So that's important to articulate that in the very beginning of the application. Mm -hmm. uh, related work expenses that you can deduct, anything plus. However, these expenses have to match your disability. For example, if you're disabled and you're working at the YMCA, you cannot send me receipts for your nails. 
which I have, believe me. <laughs> if you're working as a mechanic, you cannot give me the dry cleaner uh, suit receipts, okay? So you have to be reasonable. It has to be within reason. And it has to be related to your disability. Uh, we understand that you have prosthesis, you have, you know, if you have, you know, you're hearing impaired, you have a cochlear implant, the batteries that you actually uh, pay for those batteries replacement, if it's $30 per month or whatever it is, we're going to use that also. We're going to stop that. Okay? Ticket to work, please. If you have an individual who's receiving disability or you guys are planning to apply for a disability, if your child applies and gets a job or something like that, make sure you contact them. This is actually part of your um, paperwork in there. Make sure you do. Get them on the ticket to work if they want to work. If they cannot work, that's fine. We understand that. We're just trying to provide you some services and some information that you have readily available um, so that can, you can use the, the support that we have. This is what is called the expedited reinstatement. We immediately can reinstate you if you actually work after all that. Um, after, you can do it for five years. You have five years to be able to work and do whatever you need to do. If you fail, you feel like you cannot do it any longer, guess what? You can come to Social Security and we can do that for you. That's a, wonder, a wonderful thing to have. And we do all that behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about it. You have to do it a lot of paperwork and say, yes, I want that. Okay, so just remember that for in the future. Uh, when it comes to an individual who's actually working, make sure that if it's working that they can actually open My Social Security online and they can submit their pay stubs online. They can actually do that, okay? Very important for us. If we see that, we will be able to actually know that you're working and we're going to initiate a work review for you, okay? If yeah, you're receiving disability. No, they can. Uh, when you come to an um, online, you cannot in, um, in put in there, like for example, if you have, you know, um, tax fee, expense or anything like that, you cannot do that. That's the only downside of this application that we have, but if you do have those expenses, make sure you fax your paperwork to Social Security or bring it in person. Keep in mind, I love my agency, but guess what, we make a lot of errors and do a lot of things, you know, sometimes backwards. Make sure that when you do provide Social Security with something, prove that you have a copy. Mm -hmm. And if you go in person, make sure they register you in there. Because when it comes to actually rebuttaling appeals, you not only have appeals for medical, you also have appeals for resources, for income, for anything pretty much. Okay? So make sure you have your proof, ask for copies. Make sure you keep copies of all that. Okay? Okay. My Social Security, if you are 18 or older, please make sure that you open my account with Social Security. Very important for you to be able to see your records. Check your earnings in there for individuals who actually are looking further down to retire. Make sure that you already have this My account, my Social Security account open so you can see your own earnings. If something in there doesn't look right, start looking for your taxes, your W-2s, okay? We can actually add income if it's not there. Let's assume that you work in 1998 for, I don't know, what, Sears. And you say, that's not there. Guess what? Bring your W-2 to us, and we'll be able to add it in there. Okay? Important to take control of your own. This is actually something that we went over, um, 1,220. Please just, this is actually for general purposes only. It could be deviations from that, depending upon your situation. For somebody who's blind in $2,040, so if you have an individual who's actually blind, that they have actually a higher um, amount that they can actually work and earn. For Social Security, uh, as a site, now it comes $771, which is actually good. We're hopefully, you know, it will increase in the future. It will be something that they will approve perhaps by the end of the year. Okay, when it comes to Medicare, um, one thing that, uh, that I want to mention to you guys, if you guys have individuals who actually have not worked into Social Security, have never, don't even have one credit, okay, they can purchase Medicare when they turn 65, but they're going to actually pay for Medicare Part A, it will be 437, okay, and Medicare Part B will be 137.50 or something like that. So 135.50. There you go. So 
That doesn't mean that because you have not worked that you cannot get Medicare. Yes, you can get it, but you have to pay for it. Both, Part A and Part B. Individuals who are already have 10 years of work or 40 quarters, what we call, or 40 credits of work, that individual is already insured to receive Medicare at age 65. Medicare Part A is free for those individuals who are insured and have the 40 quarters, and Medicare Part B will be 135.50 or whatever amount will be at the time that you turn 65, okay? Okay, this is something that is actually in your folders in there. We only, I only can give you the 2018 because just recently, two weeks ago, before I actually made those packages, they actually released the 2019. How many months do we have for the 2019? <laughs> <laughs> if it were to quarter, maybe for next year. So we're actually working a little bit backwards when it comes to this book. However, the only thing that changes on this book right here, nothing changes when it comes to policies or instructions in there, right? The only thing that changes was the changes of the um, SGA, which is 1,220, which that information is already added in there. Um, so for that book, it's absolutely wonders. It does a lot of wonder for you. It has a bunch of information, and I will keep it for life and eternity, even if the amounts change. Okay? Mm -hmm. But you can actually obtain a new copy online if you want to. As we start taking questions, something occurred to me. Uh, that I think may actually be helpful. So I'm going to share a piece of my screen here. So we'll bring up Google. And if you go to the arcofnova.org and you touch resource library, and you go down and you click, you want resources related to Medicaid. That handout I mentioned for disability determinations at age 18 is right there. And so it talks a little bit about this change and what this is. And for the process here, the two reports, links to the two things you will be sending in to the Department of Social Services. Like I said, then, like with everything in the system, keep a copy. But in this particular case, keep a copy. And then use it right after you turn 18 and use it again for applying for Social Security. Because they'll want to see that same paperwork. It's a Although you need a new one with the new signature with a new date, okay? Okay, so we'll go back to our Q&A, and then we'll let um, folks here in the room ask questions, and I'll scroll up real quick to see what folks online have sent in as well. Okay, so any questions? I know that the SSI, Social Security doesn't make anything easy, okay? So wait until you retire. Um, that's why we're here for you. Um, so any questions in regards to SSI or Titus? Um, it's actually, so we just moved back. We lived in overseas for 20 years. This is back. Our oldest daughter is now 20. We're then international school judge with disability. And um, so all of our medical records are from overseas. Mm -hmm. Do you accept? Absolutely. Overseas? Absolutely. We can request those medical records depending on what country um, it is. Um, we can get them a little quicker, but it takes a while. But we can get them. If you have copies, that'd be better. Is that due to the military? No. No? No. Okay. We actually had um, individuals who are coming from other countries and they bring their own medical records. Um, some, some of them are in Spanish, so what we do, we translate a whole lot and perhaps, I don't know whether you guys have anybody who translate in there, but we actually take anything that they bring in, uh, bring us, you know, we don't turn down anything. If you bring it over to us, we're going to take it, we're going to send it to them. They will determine what they can take or not, mm -hmm. but if you bring anything to us, you know, definitely we will, we will send it to them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to run through real quickly some of the online questions because it, there's no time stamp on them, so I think we've addressed a lot of them, but just to reiterate real quickly. Better to apply online or in person? Online, right, for benefits online. Online, by and large. Um, we heard about the disability determination process prior to 18. How do we do that? So we talked about it a little bit here, and we just looked at that handout. If my child, adult child with moderate um, intellectual disability and autism are the diagnosis, could they possibly be eligible? Awesome. And yes, we went through that. Are the slides available? Yes, you will get a copy. Um, has anyone with a Medicaid waiver ever been turned down for SSI? Sure, if you don't do the paperwork correctly. Um, but generally speaking, if you've met the financial eligibility for Medicaid and you've been able to keep that, you're going to meet the financial eligibility, but it may be a technical reason that you're getting turned down. Certainly quirky things like that happen, but rare. Um, does someone who's 18 with SSI and a waiver automatically qualify for the free or reduced lunch program at school. If you qualify based upon 
income for Social Security income and assets, you are very likely to qualify for free and reduced lunch, but you still have to apply through the school and be considered. And depending upon, in different jurisdictions in the state have different criteria for free and reduced lunch support. Um, so if you are 18 with a Medicaid waiver and you have you have to get Social Security before you turn 19 or you lose your waiver. That's true. Medicaid needs to make sure that by the time you are 19, Medicaid and Social Security are agreeing. You have a disability. They both agree. Yes, we see you in both of these systems. Otherwise, you don't get any warning. There's no big <laughs> someone calling you and giving you a heads up. You will go to the doctor or you will go to pay a care attendant. You will go to somehow use your Medicaid services and you'll find that they have been cut off. And then you kind of need to pull the threads and backtrack to figure out what happened. Um, I received the letter telling me my daughter's turned 18, but didn't receive a pack for disability <coughs> determination. So that gets right back to the links that we just showed you. So turning in that paperwork to the Department of Family Services in Fairfax or Department of Social Services if you're living somewhere other than Fairfax. And like everything else, keep a copy. Um, do you want every single IEP update for social no, the security? Most recent one. Just the most recent. And every single doctor's visit? You know what? The more complete the package, the better. So we want, if, if you don't have a whole lot, please give us everything that you, that you have, okay? It's better to have a whole lot than have little and then be turned down. And the result of that is a denial. Just bring us everything. Sometimes, you know, the individuals, um, uh, when they do the interview, they say, oh, I'm taking this, I'm taking that medication. And I'll say, is that for cholesterol? So they're telling you they have back pain, but they never mention cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So when we're going through medications, that's when we find out that they actually have other medical issues. So bring us the whole picture. Give us the whole picture. And the last one we have is if parents have guardianship over an adult child, do they still need to attest to the SSI application? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, one more thing that I wanted to mention to all of you guys that I understand that there's Social Security is a huge, huge, we have a lot of it's, uh, programs and a lot of things that we deal with, okay? Um, there's another program that we'd like to mention to you guys so you can keep it in mind for in the future. If we actually have made a determination that you have a disabled child at age 18, between age 18 or 22, okay? That person could be potentially eligible under the parent's record. Very important. So when you go for retirement or whatever it is, disability or whatever it is, guess what? When you sit down and they ask you, do you have a disabled individual under age whatever, 18 to 22, say yes to that if you do have a disabled individual who's getting SSI or not getting SSI, okay? If you have a disabled individual, please say yes to that question. Because guess what? If you are receiving, going to be receiving retirement, we're going to actually determine whether there's enough to pay for that individual and take an application for that disabled individual. That will not affect your main check. Your primary amount is yours. But there is something that we contribute. All of us contribute to what is called a family max. I call them buckets. Okay? And that bucket is actually uh, funding that you are paying, I'm paying, and everybody's paying, right? to protect the wife, the children, okay? So it's very important that you guys keep that in mind. Same thing, if you are married and your uh, husband is deceased and you became disabled, guess what? You can apply on the disabled widow's benefits too, but you have to have, you have to be disabled between age 50 and age 60, okay? So make sure you keep that in mind. Of course, if you're working, we're going to take that into consideration too as well. But, you know, those are things that people don't know and they miss on that and those benefits. And children, we don't want any child who's 18 to miss out on anything, any type of eligibility, okay? Thank you all very much for thank joining you. us. And big thank you for our presentation.